This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 196 was recorded on December 5th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, which happens to be my favorite podcast when it comes to quant and rules-based investing. This week's feature interview guest will be Mark Gordon, Chief Investment Officer for Ascent Oil Fund, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Regular listeners will remember that last week on this program, I encourage you to watch our good friend, Hedgeye founder, Keith McCullough's interview with Mark Gordon, in which Mark lays out his entire bullish intermediate to long-term case for crude oil prices. Now, don't worry, folks. This is not going to just be a repeat of that interview with a different interviewer. We're going to assume that you already heard Mark's interview with Keith McCullough, and we're going to pick up where Keith left off, arm you with Mark's slide deck, which Hedgeye didn't give you, and then we're going to go much deeper on long-term crude oil fundamentals. Mark is one of very few people in the crude oil market who, in my opinion, is focused on all the right issues. While most analysts are obsessed with short-term inventory signals, I think they're missing the big picture in most cases. Now, Mark most definitely sees the same long-term big picture that I do in terms of what the important issues are. The thing is, we actually disagree rather strongly on a few of those important issues. So we don't agree completely. So for this week's feature interview, we'll take a slightly different format. Well, Mark and I will compare notes, emphasizing both the areas where we agree and those where we disagree, seeking out the reasons why we see this picture very differently. I really enjoyed this interview with Mark, and I think you will too. And then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick has another of his famous chart books. We'll cover an update on what's going on with the S&P and the recent market correction. And then Patrick is going to demystify this concept of gamma, those oh-so-elusive option Greeks that confuse so many people, and which Charlie McElligot frequently refers to in his interviews. So if you're not quite sure what Charlie's talking about when he says there's going to be a gamma flip, don't worry. Patrick is going to take us to the bottom of that issue before today's episode is over. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 started the week with a a pretty good drop. Uh, What's your take on all of this? You know, Patrick, I've just been rolling my eyes at this all week. There have been several little news events, but it seems like the biggest catalyst for this little market tantrum was when President Trump commented that in some ways he would prefer to wait until after the election for a China trade deal. Now, as should have been obvious, but apparently wasn't to many market participants, this is 100.0% consistent with President Trump's personality and past negotiating style. It should be obvious that he is anticipating that China will attempt to threaten him by saying, hey, we might delay this in order to make you look bad till after the election. President Trump is trying to show them, look, uh, I'm happy with either before or after the election. I'm not going to be intimidated by time tactics. So it's very obviously negotiation posturing, which means precisely nothing about financial markets or what we should expect for corporate earnings. But of course, the market just loves to react to headlines. So we saw this absolute outright crazy panic. What was it? Almost 100 S&P points to the downside. And already a few days later, we've retraced more than 50% of that. And Patrick, what I think is actually kind of sad when you think about it is we saw this huge, huge market reaction in response to what I think was a misinterpretation of an entirely routine negotiating posturing tactic that meant nothing. Took us down almost 100 S&P points. But when the Speaker of the House of Representatives formally announced today that for only the third time in the nation's 250-year history, the House of Representatives will proceed with articles 
of impeachment against the president of the United States. That resulted in a much, much smaller market downdraft in comparison. So uh, I, I think the markets have their signals all crazy. In any event, I think that most likely this is a blip that's going to fully retrace. Now, to be sure, the trade issue is a very important one. But all of these little headlines here and there along the way are just negotiating posturing. It's not important as far as I'm concerned. So I expect that probably the melt-up is going to continue. Again, the trade situation is important. We're going to get some kind of trade deal. It'll probably disappoint markets. It won't be what people hoped for, but there's going to be some kind of trade deal. The real driver here, as Ray Dalio has described so incredibly eloquently, and by the way, there is another link in your Research Roundup email to another excellent interview with Ray Dalio for all of the parts where Paul Tudor Jones is not talking over him and interrupting him. Ray makes some really excellent points. So, you know, as Ray has pointed out very well, it's monetary policy the Federal Reserve going back to quantitative easing, even if they're not going to call it that, buying up bonds, which puts money in the hands of investors. They use that money to buy other financial assets. It drives markets up. That's the real driver of this market. The trade stuff is just punctuating the moves up and down along the way. And I think this blip is going to be forgotten and we'll probably move to new all-time highs before we know it. All right, well, let's move on to the dollar index because the dollar has been uh, weakening. We're now definitively below the 98 handle. What's your take here on the dollar? Well, you know, it's it really interesting. The last week, on one hand, we did establish a pattern, at least briefly, of higher highs and higher lows that seem to suggest, okay, it looked like the rally was on. But just in the last three or four sessions, we've now broken that trend of higher lows, and we've got a lower low. We need to see below 97 before it's time to really get concerned, but certainly it's time to take pause here. My belief until this week that it seemed like we were probably on a rally that was likely to take us back to new all-time highs above 99 spot 50, not looking so bright right now. Uh, I don't think it's time to to really throw in the towel until we get daily closes below 97 on the December contract of the dollar index. But uh, we're already getting pretty close at 97 spot 38 as we speak on Thursday afternoon. So we'll have to see what next week brings us. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. I have to ask you, what's going on? Holy cow, Patrick. You know, when we spoke last Thursday, I said, okay, look, it seems like the preponderance of evidence suggests that we should be resolving to upside in price. But don't be surprised because we've seen so many head fakes and false signals and so forth. For all we know, it might crash tomorrow. Well, that's exactly what happened. It mini crashed the very next day on Friday on the most ridiculous. You you thought the stock market action was based on silly news. I I don't think this could have happened other than on a uh, Friday after the holiday when it was thin liquidity market conditions and junior traders on the desk because the trigger, the catalyst for this massive downside move was a statement from Saudi Arabia, which in my opinion was badly misinterpreted by both the press and by traders. What Saudi Arabia said is, look, if we're going to cut production, we need to honor our word and actually cut production, not just talk about it. So this business of having a meeting and announcing that we're cutting production, and then Saudi Arabia actually does cut production and the other countries cheat and don't cut their production as much as they said they would, we're not going to tolerate that anymore. We're going to call the other countries to account and insist that they actually cut their production too. Now, if you think about that, what Saudi Arabia is saying here is, hey, if we're going to support prices by taking supply off of the market by cutting production, we got to really do it, not just talk about it. That ought to be bullish. But the way it was interpreted is Saudi Arabia is threatening to increase production if the other countries don't do their part and keep their promises. Now, I can't find any evidence of any Saudi Arabian official actually threatening to increase production. I think that was the press that said that, and it was repeated without fact-checking, and traders took it seriously. And on a thin liquidity Friday, everybody panicked and sold crude oil for no good reason. I don't think that it actually meant what they thought. And of course, what we've seen in the last couple of days is we've retraced 
replaced all of that and we're moving back toward a new range high, a little bit higher than we were last week. So this whole crazy move down was an overreaction to misinterpreted news as far as I'm concerned. But what needs to be seen from here is, okay, what happens next? Because if you look at the history of these production cuts. The OPEC meeting is today, Thursday, and then the OPEC plus meeting, which is Russia and another non-OPEC member countries participating. That doesn't come till tomorrow. But the JMMC, which is a subcommittee of OPEC, already went ahead today and recommended a 500,000 barrel per day increase in the cuts. So they would go from a 1.2 million barrel per day production cut to a 1.7 million barrel per day production cut, another 500,000 barrels of cut production. That's the recommendation. All that Saudi Arabia was saying last Friday is if we're going to say we're going to do this, let's actually do it this time and not just talk about it. Uh, These are all bullish indications the market has moved higher. But there's plenty of history that shows us that sometimes These OPEC meetings can be a sell-the-news event where all the upside price action is in anticipation of that production cut announcement. And once we've got the announcement, the market ends up selling off. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen next. Certainly, we've been stuck in a consolidation pattern for weeks. Uh, Hopefully, we'll see a significant break up or down from here. And time will tell which direction it happens. It was very interesting to me to note that Saudi Arabia today priced their IPO at the high end of the pricing range. And, you know, I I think that if a question we have to ask ourselves is, is Saudi Arabia's strategy to say, okay, this domestic IPO, that was it, that was the only IPO? Or are they setting up, as they've alluded, to do an international IPO after the fact? If they're still going to do an international IPO, you know that they're going to do everything they possibly can to support the price from here, make sure the people that bought in this IPO see some price appreciation so that it begets more buyers for the next larger international, I guess it wouldn't be an IPO, it would be a secondary offering at that point. Is that the plan or is the IPO that we already had going to be the only IPO? The fact that they priced it at the high end of the range suggests to me that maybe this will be the only IPO. We'll see what actually happens there. But I think that Saudi Arabia's intentions with whether or not there's going to be an international secondary offering will factor heavily in how aggressively they work to support prices from here. So it's going to be very, very interesting to watch this market. Uh, Didn't mention EIA inventory briefly. Crude oil, big drawdown this week, 4.9 million barrel drawdown. That's after a string of 10 weeks of almost all, with one exception in those 10 weeks. It was all big builds on inventory. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 302,000 barrels. So still not a big drawdown, but a drawdown just the same. Remember that the Keystone Pipeline is still operating at reduced pressure and reduced capacity in the wake of that spill that occurred in North Dakota. The thing is that that big crude oil drawdown was offset by finished product builds and big ones. Gasoline, 3.4 million barrels. Distillates, 3.1 million barrels. So between gasoline and distillates, that's six and a half million barrels of finished product builds it to offset 4.9 million barrels of crude oil drawdown. U.S. production holding that 12.9 million barrel new record, all-time record for U.S. production, still holding steady. Imports 6 million barrels, exports 3.1 million barrels. Tape action was muted in immediate reaction to the news coming out of inventory, but it had been way up in anticipation of that ever since API reported that there was likely to be a drawdown in inventory. There had been a huge rally, and of course, we were doing that on the back of Friday's sell-off that really didn't make any sense. So we're back up to a new cycle high, but we're still holding at key resistance levels and have yet to really decisively break through them. We'll see what happens in coming days. I won't be at all surprised, Patrick, if we don't see a significant move in one direction or the other, but I could see it going either way from here. All right. Well, let's move on to gold because we've been in a multi-week range here. And uh, on Monday, we got that breakout a little bit to the upside. Is that uh, for real or what's your take here on gold? 
No, Patrick, I don't think that this uh, bounce has legs at all. I think it's over, and I think it's already overdone, frankly. The key Fibonacci support level to watch is 1448. We were bouncing off that. We got the news of the trade deal and President Trump's comments about the trade deal. That freaked people out a little bit. Gold was up on that. But then the bigger move came in reaction to North Korea, making some comments that suggest that they might back out of the obligations that they made in the treaty with the United States, and then President Trump alluding to the possibility of military action in response if they failed to uphold their obligations. That's what freaked everybody out. That's what got gold going. And even with that excitement and and panic in the system, it didn't even get up to the channel trend line that's providing resistance right around 1487 or so as we speak now. We never got there. It looks like it's probably already topped out. So I think it's done here. Now, the the key support level to watch, as I said, is 1448. I think we will eventually get through that. I just noticed today, in addition to the several reasons that I've mentioned in previous shows that I like 1420 as a buying point, that has to do with a couple of Fibonacci levels. It's also where the channel support line is. I haven't even noticed until I was looking at a tweet from one of the veteran crude oil traders on uh, Twitter today saying that that's also a head and shoulders target. So a lot of different technical indications suggest 1420 is a good target, uh, I think, to start buying in size. If it turns out that this was the bottom and it really is going to break higher from here, well, then I'm glad that I bought more at 1452. But uh, I don't think that's going to be the bottom. I think we still have lower to go. As far as getting all bullish here, you've got to see a daily close or preferably a weekly close above that channel resistance line, which, as I said, is right now around 1487 or so. Until we get above that and stay above that, I don't think there's any reason to get bullish and get excited here. All right, well, let's move on to the 10-year Treasury yields, which really have been pinned for the last couple of months. Which direction are interest rates heading from here in your mind? Well, if my mind knew that, I'd have something more decisive to say than I do, Patrick. So uh, I'll just respect our listeners' time and and say I don't really have a lot of conviction here. I I think that there's a good macro case, as I've said many times before, for lower yields until inflation gets in the way. And I just don't know what the timing is going to be. We're starting to see those inflation signals on the horizon. It seems like those inflation indications are starting to tick up. That's enough to scare me out of the long side of this trade. This week's feature interview guest is Mark Gordon, CIO of Ascent Oil Fund. So, Eric, why did we invite Mark onto the show this week? Well, what a perfect week. You know, you heard my commentary on oil and my frustration with the market focusing on all of the silliest signals, getting all freaked out and, and, and excited about something like Saudi Arabia saying something that really, if you thought about it, should be bullish. But if you just looked at the most short-sighted, myopic way of looking at it, which is maybe Saudi Arabia is not in a good mood with respect to its compatriots for the OPEC meeting, which is going on today and tomorrow. You know, everybody gets focused on all the wrong issues, I think, is just my sense of the oil market. Here's a guy, Mark Gordon, who really gets it. He sees the big picture and he understands what the important issues are. So it just resonates for me. I I salute this guy for having a, a really good grasp of what the real issues are, what the important issues are in terms of knowing where the oil market is headed in the coming years, as opposed to just what's going to happen this week or next week. Now, the thing is, as much as I I cannot overstate my enthusiasm about how Mark sees all the right issues, we don't agree on all of those issues. We actually see some of them quite differently. Uh, I'll save my disagreements for after the feature interview. You can come back and ask me again in postgame. But let's start by listening to what Mark has to say. Now, he laid out his whole case in his interview with Keith McCullough. We're going to pick up where Keith McCullough left off, and we're going to go deeper into those oil market fundamentals where Keith's interview was primarily macro-driven. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. I did a full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson, the host of this excellent podcast, back on September 7th, 2019. The download link is in your research roundup email. We discussed a number of key issues about the value of having a rules-based investment strategy in a portfolio. 
In our conversation, Neil shared some insights that may surprise you, especially when it comes to how trend-following strategies don't really operate the way some market commentators suggest they do. For more information, including a free book about trend following and the accredited investor slide deck from my interview with Niels Kastrup Larsen, go to toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro slides. Check them out. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Mark Gordon is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Mark Gordon, the chief investment officer for Ascent Oil Fund. Listeners, you'll remember that I encouraged you last week on our show to watch Mark's interview with Keith McCullough, our friend, the founder of Hedgeye. For anyone who didn't, a link to that is in your research roundup email. We're going to do something a little bit different in today's interview format. I really feel like Mark is one of very few people in the industry who really is looking at the right issues in the oil market. Mark's got a whole pitch that goes with this. It was in the interview with Keith McCullough. We're going to assume that you already watched that and you've got that. I do recommend that you first download the slide deck, which is also linked in your research roundup email. If you're not yet registered and you don't have a research roundup email for that link, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads next to Mark's picture on our homepage. That slide deck will be referenced extensively in Mark's interview with Keith McCullough, but Hedgeye doesn't give you the slide deck. We do. So start with the slide deck. If you haven't already, watch the interview with Keith McCullough where you'll understand the background of Mark's pitch and how he sees the oil market. I think he's looking at all of the right issues. I just have different opinions on some of those issues. So we're going to go the next step after that interview with Keith and really get into the nitty gritty of some of the places where we see eye to eye and some where we don't. So Mark, thanks so much for joining us. I want to dive right into page four of your deck here because you're really making a profound Point with this slide. You're showing that in the fourth quarter of 1998 and the third quarter of 2008, just 10 years later, you've got basically the same inventory conditions. And at both of those dates, you had the same amount of inventory in the tanks in Cushing, Oklahoma, and elsewhere around the nation. But holy cow, it's literally almost a 15 to 1 difference in price. How is that even possible? What's going on here? So I would, I would modify what you said just slightly and point out it's the same inventory in the days of forward demand, which I think is the correct way of looking at it. But of course, demand would have grown over those 10 years. So the absolute level of inventory would have been a little bit higher, but the days of forward demand is the correct way of looking at it. And indeed, when we had oil at $10 and we had oil at $147, we had the same days of forward demand. And so what that tells you is that inventory is not what's driving price, but it's the larger regime around inventory, the, the framework for which you think about oil, which is, which is driving the price. And so what's important is to recognize the framework that you're in and when it is you might move from one regime to another. I'd also point out you know, on the next page that currently today, Globally, we do have normal inventories, although it doesn't feel that way. And I, I think the oil price is below where it could be with the same level of inventories because of the negative sentiment or you know, negative regime. And um, I think if you change regimes with the very same level of inventories, you could get a higher price. I'd also point out that it's not so much the level of inventories that matters, but the direction of inventories. So draining inventories are very bullish and, you know, inventories that are increasing are bearish. But if you go back to 2009 after the great financial crisis, the oil price rallied right through 2009 while inventories grew, which, again, sort of makes the point that it's the oil price regime that is driving what the price does and not necessarily what inventories are doing. 
Well, Mark, I really want to salute you because I feel that you have just very succinctly described one of the most important concepts in the entire oil market, which is almost everybody gets obsessed with these inventory numbers as if that's the center of the universe. Like the every Wednesday at 1030 in the morning, EIA releases the weekly inventory report and, and traders all act as if that's the center of the universe. And I think you've shown very clearly here that it's really not the primary driver of price. The primary driver of price is the much larger, broader set of expectations around the regime that people think we're in. Now, back in that 2008 time frame when we had $147 oil, that was what you've termed the peak oil regime, where there was a widespread expectation based on uh, the predictions of Marion King Hubbard made way back in 1956 that we were going to reach a peak of oil production. And once we hit that peak production level, didn't really matter what you did, you, you wouldn't be able to produce any more. And if demand was greater than that, it could cause crazy gyrations in price. And that's how we got to $147 oil. I think where we maybe have slightly different views of this is I think we both agree that Hubbard's peak is real. The, the predictions that Hubbard made about geology had some real basis to them. And I think that for a while, the finance industry got overly obsessed with them and thought it meant only one thing, which is the price just had to go to the moon. And they didn't really think it through and realize, as you so eloquently described in your interview with Keith McCullough, that if you invoke George Soros's idea of reflexivity, you know, it's, it's the price going to 147 that changes the game and it brings a whole bunch of investment into unconventional production, which really changed the game. And of course, Hubbard's predictions were about conventional production because unconventional production, things like tight oil and CO2 injection and some of the other fancy technologies that exist for getting oil out of the ground didn't exist in, in Hubbard's day. Let's move ahead to this description of Hubbard's peak. Please refresh our listeners. How is it that you see the regime change from the, the age of peak oil to the age of abundance? I, I think we see it differently. So let's start with your description, and then I'd like to add a little bit of contrast to that. Well, so I think what happened, and, and I, I guess we're going to talk about you know how I think the market got Hubbard's peak wrong. But I think what happened is, as you pointed out, the oil price went up and that brought on a whole bunch of new supply, primarily shale or tight oil, but also the Canadian oil sands. And we had some subsalt Brazil. And then on top of that, we have had this new demand paradigm that's being driven by concerns around global warming. So I think we went from a focus on scarcity to a shift towards abundance. And really, the two factors driving the focus on abundance are one, tight oil or shale, and two, it's concerns around peak demand from CO2. So it's kind of amazing how you can go from scares of not enough oil to, you know, a sense that we have too much oil, but that's precisely, I think, what happened from 2012 to today. Well, I think we are in violent agreement that what has occurred here is we went from a scare era of the fear is we're going to run out of oil, which actually was never the prediction of Hubbard's Peak. He never said we were running out of oil. It was a rate of extraction prediction, but it caused the market to panic that somehow the world was about to run out of oil. Now we've got this opposite fear that we're going to have too much oil and, and you know we're not going to know what to do with it. I think that where things went wrong, as I see them, is Hubbard's peak was very real. And I think he very accurately predicted when conventional oil production would peak. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, uh, the peak oil crowd, and I was definitely one of those peak oil kooks that you alluded to in your interview with Keith. A lot of people think that we never saw shale coming. We never saw tight oil coming. That's not true. We knew all about it back in 2009, 2010. But at the time, the analysis that went into it, and Art Berman was one of the people who had done quite a bit of it, was saying, look, tight oil, at the time people were calling it shale oil, 
was very, very real. We knew about it, but because it required so much investment and because the decline rates in production were so rapid, you know, you put these wells online, they'd start producing oil for two or three years, and then they were down to almost nothing. The prediction was in order for that to really make a difference, to offset the predictions of Hubbard's Peak in what would happen with conventional oil production, you would need so much capital expenditure going into the oil patch that it would be nearly impossible because what it would take would be a crazy environment where you've got all of the central banks around the world simultaneously pumping money into the economy so that there's so much easy money chasing the junk bond market and so forth that shale drillers would have a virtually unlimited source of capital to tap to drill more and more shale wells. Well, guess what happened? In reaction to the great financial crisis, we had exactly that uh, bonanza of easy money. A lot of it did go into the shale patch. They didn't make a whole lot of money. There wasn't a tremendous amount of profit made in those investments, but it did flood the market with oil and it offset. If you look at, at the production graphs, really conventional oil, the stuff that's easy and cheap to get out of the ground, the stuff that you can produce for 20 or $25 a barrel by drilling a hole in the ground or in shallow water and just pumping oil out without any fracking or horizontal drilling or any of the expensive technologies, that kind of oil really did peak in about 2005 in terms of production. The additional production that's come since then has come from much more expensive unconventional oil. And I think where we differ a little bit in our views is I think it's mostly about a crazy spree of almost unlimited financing to finance what I would consider to be malinvestment in the shale patch. And my prediction is the next round, because what, what will happen is eventually shale will play out. The, the next obvious targets after that are deep water offshore and particularly Arctic offshore, where you got to go through the Arctic ice cap before you get to, you know, the next oil discovery. That stuff is going to be super expensive. And I predict that even if this, you know, monetary policy environment we have where central banks are providing incredible amounts of liquidity into the system, I don't think the free flow of capital into the oil market is going to continue the way it has because I think investors have finally woken up and said, wait a minute, th this tight oil stuff it produces more oil, but it doesn't make us a lot of money. And I think that when there's an even bigger investment in Arctic deep water offshore rigs, there's not going to be a lot of investors lined up around the block waiting to invest in it. So I come to many of the same conclusions that you do, but I, I think you probably don't see it the way I just described. You see a different set of reasons that the next time around as we get to, let, let's say, the, you know, the, so I think we probably do agree that Arctic offshore is going to be the next thing after the shale plays start to play out. I think you have a different reason for thinking that those are not going to save the day in the sense of continuing this age of abundance. How do you see it and how does it differ from the way I see it? So you gave me a lot to unpack there, and there are uh, some things that we, we uh, you know, very much agree on and some things that we have a slightly different take. I think you mentioned that back in 2005, it uh, seemed like conventional production had, had rolled over, or maybe, I mean, there's a lot of peak oil people that back then recognized that. And I can remember Matt Simmons following the data monthly, and we, we saw the 2005 peak, and that you know, continued on for a, a few years. But if you, if you go back to then, you can think of Oman, which is the country in the Middle, Middle East, that was one of those shots ac across the bow of, of oil production, along with Cantorell in Mexico, and uh, the largest offshore field that started to decline quickly. But if you look at Oman, what happened is uh, everyone got surprised by production there starting to fall. And that was one of the things that drove Matt Simmons to think, oh, this might happen to the whole Middle East. And uh, there was this whole narrative about how Oman was drilling horizontal wells and, you know, the the water levels crossed the horizontal wells, and all of a sudden production started to fall faster than what was expected. And uh, you know, Oman was the test case for what was going to happen in Saudi Arabia, and, and soon, you know, the whole Middle Eastern production was about to fall. And that was that was back in 2005. Well, Oman last year hit a new peak of production, so its production dropped and then came back up again. And I think that that is actually what happened to all of 
conventional production in aggregate, especially if you include deep, deep water, meaning you add in there the Brazilian production. And peak oil also would include any conventional production from the OPEC countries that they had held back in, in spare capacity. So if you think of what happened in, in America, we did have a, a large amount of spare capacity. The Texas Railroad Commission was sort of in charge of managing that. And uh, when Hubbard made his prediction, all that spare capacity ended up being used and we still peaked. So what I think is I think conventional production has not peaked yet. I think it's been on a plateau since you know the early 2000s. I actually think it's grown just slightly. And I think that conventional production is going to hit this difficult spot in 2021, 2022. And part of that is clearly driven from the CapEx cycle. We had you know, very large CapEx spend from 2010 to 2014 with the $100 oil regime. And then what happened is when oil fell in 2014, the industry really you know, had the largest CapEx cuts in history. And I have a slide on that that, that you can see, um, but we haven't recovered from that. And so what I think is that conventional production is going to start to decline in 2021 or right around then. And I, I feel like this is quite predictable because you have not only the geologic issue that, you know, King Hubbard brought up, but you have a CapEx issue. And so in the, the CapEx issue, you can count the projects. And where we are right now, this moment is two of the very last projects sanctioned the $100 oil world. That would be uh, Johan Severdrop in, uh, in Norway, which was discovered in 2010. Um, so that just came on in October, and that's ramping. And that's a very large oil field. I think it's the third largest oil field found in the, uh, at least in the Norwegian shelf. And so that's an increment of about 450,000. And then the other one is um, Brazil. They're, they're bringing on a lot of production right now. The interesting thing about Brazil is since I had the hedge eye interview, they actually put out their um, production forecast for 2020 and that, they say it's not going to grow. So the large number of FPSOs that they've put on are they're going to show us some growth, I think, first half over first half. But on an annual basis, we're not going to see it. So that's actually pretty shocking because one of the pillars of growth is not contributing growth. Now, of course, Petrobras says that it's going to grow later in the future, but I'm a little skeptical of that because we're not going to have the same number of FPSOs coming on. So for me, we did not see a peak of conventional production back in 2005. We saw a dip. And then with the high oil price, we were actually able to bring on more production. And this ties in with you know the modified Hubbard curve that I have in my presentation. I think because we never ramped as high as we could have, we basically deferred the moment of peak oil. And I think that's just about to hit us now. And I think the irony is back in you know, 2003 and four and five and six, everyone was focused on, on this and now no one's focused on it. So I think that's a large change. Now you talked about shale oil and how that was driven by basically a, a financial bubble. And I think there's some truth to that, but I also think that to a certain extent, it's popular to throw the shale model under the, the bus, even though this is where Exxon and Chevron are putting a lot of their CapEx right now, and they've clearly you know, validated the model. And so I think if people were to think about shale, the irony is their production profile, meaning the sharp declines are the best model for production that you could hope from, from an IRR perspective. I mean, the oil industry is about spending money to get oil. And you spend the money on drilling, and with a time delay, you get, the, you get the oil back. And what shale does is it gives you the oil back very, very quickly. You would always want to get the majority of oil back in year one if you could. The problem with the shale model is not the decline curve or the production profile, the production profile is actually quite good because you get oil back quickly. The problem is the amount of oil you get per well. 
And so if you were to compare shale oil to an offshore project, I mean, the offshore project, you spend five to seven years bringing online, and then you get production for a very long period of time. And now it's always inferior to wait five to seven years to get the oil. But where the offshore project benefits is that each well gives you an order of magnitude more oil. And so that's the improvement. That's why offshore can be better than shale. Although today, probably, it always depends upon each specific project. But I would think that the costs, depending upon the project, or or at least the returns are similar for, for both. And so what I think is I think shale has done an amazing job of taking down its costs. In 2010 to 2014, we would never have thought that the industry could be cash flow break even more or less at $55 oil. We would have thought that it would have taken $80 oil to do that. So they've brought down their costs. And and here is the opportunity for these companies. If the oil price goes back up, they will produce a lot of cash flow, more than what would have happened without this correction. The problem, though, is that their resource base is now a lot smaller than what we thought it was five years ago. One, because we've been producing for five years, and two, because it has just shrunk for a number of reasons which we can go into. Well, I'm going to jump in then, and I want to highlight some of the really excellent graphs and charts that you've got in your slide deck, which support the points that you've just made and which lead us into maybe our next discussion topic. So listeners on the slide deck, be sure to notice on page nine, that graph is showing just lower 48 states in the United States. The, the reason for that is it's where we have the best data, but it illustrates such an incredibly important concept, which is the heyday of of oil discovery was the 1920s and 1930s. The lag is decades after the discoveries occur before you get to the peak of production. And if we're looking in isolation at the lower 48 United States, that peak in production was right around 1970, by the way, predicted by King Hubbard in 1956. So that's, what, 14 years uh, ahead of time. Really terrific prediction. He went on to predict that global oil production, for which there's much less robust data available, would probably peak right around 2000 and for conventional production that seems like it was fairly close of course we've continued to increase production thanks to unconventional production after that moving on on page 10 you can see filling in those expectations the heyday of discovery and i think this is true not just of the lower 48 but globally was decades and decades ago so instead of sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for next wednesday's 10:30 a.m. inventory report to come out just absorb these pictures showing us the big picture of the big discoveries are behind us. We're going to get to it becoming more and more difficult and more and more expensive to continue to produce the oil that we need. And we see that very clearly on page 10. As I move on to page 12, we're starting to get to, I think, what has to be the the next major topic of discussion, Mark, because we see this a, a little bit differently. You've got going from page 12 where we see Hubbard's Peak You're showing that we've produced less than the theoretical maximum, and you go on on page 13 to project how we're going to continue to produce until there's kind of a a point around 2019 to 2021 where you get to an inevitable decline. Uh, I very much agree with you that this moment of or day of reckoning, if you will, is coming and it's going to result in a major regime change where the mentality of the oil market shifts away from age of abundance to age of, oh shit, we've got a problem. I think we see it differently in terms of how we get there. I think it's much more capex driven where where you get to the point where it's okay we've used up most of the shale plays we need another really big major round of investment to build all of the arctic offshore drilling rigs and so forth that are necessary i i do think that you could theoretically continue to extend that red line upward even beyond 2021 if you had unlimited capital 
which I don't think we're going to have. So I think we maybe see it a little differently. How do you see it, and why do you think the Day of Reckoning is coming sometime in the next few years? Well, so you just mentioned unlimited capital. And let me take you back to the U.S. page nine. You can see there was a peak in 1970. And then in, I guess that's late 80s, there's another peak. And the two things that were added here were Gulf of Mexico and Alaska, right? So in both of those cases, we sort of extended this plateau, and those were real large increments of oil that came on. But it wasn't until we got to shale that we're, we were able to, to, to turn it around. And so I guess the point I'm making here is that oil is finite and unlimited capital doesn't always fix the problem. And I think in a way, this is sort of Hubbard's point. But capital or, or you know, prices in the industry have an impact. So on page 12, from a global perspective, what I'm trying to show here is that we didn't ramp production up as high as we could have. So the consequence of that is, I've got to step back here. The way Hubbard basically did his theory is he, he, he observed discoveries in the lower 48 and said, hey, that has a bell curve shape. And then he said, production is going to have a bell curve shape as well. And he applied a lag to it. And so if you have a bell curve shape, you always peak at 50%. So the peak oil guys back in the early 2000s tried to use the same methodology. So they were always focused upon when's the 50% point. And so, I mean, you know, some had a 2003 forecast, some had a 2005 forecast, some were 2007. The center point of most of the forecasts were, were 2010. And the reason they were 2010 was because the assumption was we had an estimated ultimate recovery of 2.5 trillion barrels. So that's what gave you 2010. And then when 2010 came and production didn't roll over, they basically said, well, I, I guess we have our estimated ultimate recovery wrong. It's probably not 2.5 trillion. It's probably 2.6 trillion. So maybe it's 2012. And obviously, it's hard to guess what's under the ground. And that's, that's always an issue. But what I'm trying to show here is that if you use the exact same estimated ultimate recovery and, and you compare a page 11 with page 15, you can see that you can get a peak in production at a much later period if you never ramp production as high as you could have. And so on page 11, with the 50% point in depletion, production is, should roll over between 2010 and 2012. And then on page 15, if you assume between 60 and 65%, it rolls over between 2020 and 2024, which is more or less now. Now, I don't have a good reason to say that it should be between 60 and 65 percent. It could be 67 percent or 70 percent, but there's some number at which it has the gravity has to sort of pull it down. And so, what I'm trying to, to do here is just show that using the same Hubbard methodology, but accounting for higher price, which basically took us off what I call the you know, theoretical maximum, you get production rolling over at a later time, but production is still constrained by the finitude of oil. And I believe that where Hubbard's very right is there is a maximum that you can produce at any moment in time. And you know that, that, that's sort of intuitive and makes sense. It's, it's tied to whether or not you have spare capacity at that moment in time. And so what I like to point out on, on page 12 is, you know, we had the, the six day war and there was an oil embargo then and price did exactly nothing. And then uh, a few years later, you had the Yom Kippur war and there was an oil embargo and the oil price went up 4X. And that just shows that there was this theoretical maximum on the way up. And I think that there'll be a theoretical maximum on the way down. So I, I think you will hit a, a geologic limitation, but it's not going to happen at the 50 percentile point. It's going to happen at some point later. So I, I think that what the world has forgotten is that oil is finite. And I think we're going to be reminded of that. And the, the, the problem we have now compared to what I was terming the, the peak oil period is back in the peak oil period, 
people were anticipating this coming, you know, with a, a 10 year lag. I, I remember the EIA commission, what was called the Hirsch report. And um, I think he was an engineer, but he basically said that if you prepare for this with a, you know, with 10 years, we'll have a almost seamless transition. But if it sneak, sneaks right up on you and it just happens with, with uh, no preparation, we're going to have a really difficult time. And I think despite his warning, we're back to, to that, it, it being upon us, because I think that conventional production, you know, whether it's CapEx or geology, I mean, the two sort of go together, but I think the conventional production is going to have a hard time staying flat after 2021. Okay, Mark, so to summarize what we've discussed so far, you and I are in violent agreement that what we have here is a situation where most people in the industry aren't even looking at the right issues. If you do look at the right issues and you do look at the big picture, we agree that there is a regime change. We went from the peak oil regime where everybody was panicking that we were running out of oil, even though that's never what King Hubbard actually predicted. Then we got into this age of abundance where everybody thinks there's just so much oil that we're not going to know what to do with it and there will always be too much. We agree that there is a day of reckoning on the horizon where we switch to the next regime where we say, wait a minute, this really is a finite resource. We really are going to have a problem. The shale revolution delayed it by a good solid decade, but the problem is not going to go away. And we get to then a perception change where we go from this age of abundance to the next age of supply fear. But I'm sure that there are some listeners listening to this saying, dude, you guys just don't get it. You're not paying attention to Elon here. All of these problems go away because we're moving away from fossil fuels. We're not going to need oil anymore because electric vehicles are going to solve everything. Uh, You and I don't agree with that, and I think we actually have different reasons for not agreeing with that. So let's start with that premise that, hey, don't worry about peak oil supply. Worry about peak oil demand. That we've got, uh, it seems like a 14-year-old Greta Thunberg leading the world into this belief that the highest priority has to be eliminating dependence on fossil fuels. We're going to adopt electric vehicles. It's going to be the next big thing. The investment you want to make here is in the electric vehicle industry. Buy Tesla. Forget about oil funds. What's wrong with that line of thinking? Well, so first off, what I would say is that we absolutely need an energy transition and energy transition is going to come. But for me, I think it's intuitive to understand that energy transition needs to come through the pricing mechanism. And that's how capitalism works. And you need a higher price to drive energy uh, transition. So if we don't get it, we're going to have a a problem. And that that problem has an impact on on two sides, both supply and, and demand. So I actually think that the concern about CO2 is going to cause an even greater oil price spike The reason being is that the majors are not investing because they're concerned about peak demand out in the future. And I think that that's going to cause a larger hit to supply than it's going to cause to demand. I mean, it was quite remarkable when a month ago we had a bid round in Brazil and all the majors decided not to participate. So we're really setting up for a problem here because the investment is just so much lower than what it would have been otherwise. And because of the lags, we don't really see it. But the the hit from EVs in this last year was de minimis. It was about 35,000 barrels a day. So it's all about what's going to happen in the future. And there's this sense that there's going to be a a hockey stick up in in the EVs. And I, I don't see that coming at all if there's not pricing signals to to drive us there. So I think, you know, if you turn to page 34 of my presentation, there's one really surprising fact here, which is EV sales right now in the third quarter are down year over year on a global basis, that is, and and also in America. But what, what really drove that was the China cut its subsidies in June. And so the numbers in China are really quite shocking. I mean, in August, EV sales were down 16% year over year. That's a big number. But then in September, it was 34% year over year. In October, it was 
46% year over year. So what happens is, is when you don't have government subsidies, you know, forcing the shift, the market falls apart. And, and what you need is you need a much higher price to make people really, you know, consider EVs. Another thing to think about is if you look at SUVs on the page 33 of my presentation, you can see how they have grown from in 2010, they were 17% of light vehicle sales. And uh, in 2018, they went all the way to 38%. So that's partly uh, an impact of prices not being high enough. And so the shift to SUVs has completely overwhelmed the shift to EVs that we've seen so far. And if you extrapolate this out into the future and you assume SUVs continue to take share as they have, they, they go to 50% over the next decade, which would be a, a slower growth rate than what we've seen over the last decade, that would actually overwhelm the movement to EVs. And there's, there's one thing about uh, CAFE standards that I think people don't think about. Governments globally are mandating CAFE standards. Uh, you know, I think the U.S. government right now is against that. But it seems irrational to be against wanting to have improving car efficiencies. But the main reason to be against that is that the way the manufacturers make cars more efficient is they make them lighter. And when they're lighter and you have an accident, there's more deaths than maimings. And th this is, I think, part of the reason people, you know, buy more SUVs because they're, they're safer. At least the perception is they're safer. I mean, you're not going to stick your wife and kids in a small car if you can afford not to. And so I am highly skeptical that we can have this transition towards electric vehicles without a higher price. And there's, there's other limitations on electric vehicles that we're not thinking about, in particular, Cobalt, I know that they're trying to engineer this out of the battery, but the reason they're trying to do that is because there's not a large enough supply of it. But cobalt's essential to prevent the battery from overheating, and it also gives, it creates additional range. And so there isn't a good model of battery that gives a long range without cobalt. And the RP ratio for cobalt is only 42. So I don't think you can get to more than 8 million EV sales per year, and all the forecasts take you way higher than that, without you know, bringing or finding a lot more cobalt. And if you're going to do that, you're probably going to need to do deep ocean exploration because there's cobalt there. But again, you're going to need a, a much higher price. So if we want to have this energy transition, we absolutely need a higher price to, to drive it, in, in my opinion. And the lack of the higher price is going to inhibit the transition to EVs. And it's already created a problem because the industry is not investing in oil supply because it's concerned about demand. Well, Mark, I think I agree with almost everything that you've said. I'd like to add a few points because I share your passion that in the long run, the right solution for the world here is to have this energy transition to where we don't depend on fossil fuels and we can run the whole world without them. But I think that the investment community massively, massively underestimates what that's going to take. And that failure of the investment community, I think, starts with the very widespread misconception that electricity is an energy source, which it is not. You've got to generate the electricity somehow. Now, you can generate electricity from coal-fired power plants. That's the most common way of doing it. When you do that, the energy it takes to drive your Tesla puts more carbon into the atmosphere than if you were driving a high-efficiency diesel vehicle. So you're not doing anything to help global warming or, or any other agenda by coal-fired electric. You can generate electricity using natural gas. Well, guess where that comes from? oil wells. So you, you still depend it on fossil fuels. You can generate electricity a lot of ways. The only way you can really generate 
environmentally friendly electricity is if we have a nuclear renaissance and that's going to require a new generation of nuclear power capability, which is not uranium fired boiling water reactors, which do clearly have serious safety issues. But we need to use different technologies, things like the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which does not produce weapons grade plutonium as a byproduct of generating electricity. It doesn't contribute to nuclear proliferation. And it is much more compatible, I think, with a long term vision of environmentally friendly, safer electricity centric energy economy. My point is simply that even if you had all those things and we politically are nowhere close to a nuclear renaissance, you would then still need a massive, massive build out of the electrical power distribution grid in most countries, including the United States around the world. All of that will take decades and billions upon billions of dollars of uh, investment in, in things that people are not figuring into the equation. So electric vehicles are totally, completely going to change the world 100 years from now. But people who think that the next 10 years are going to be where we forget about fossil fuels and the whole world switches to electric vehicles are completely completely missing what it's really going to take to get there. And, and I also agree with all the other things that you've said. I just wanted to add that to it. But as we're starting to uh, run out of time here, and you know, I wish we had three hours because I'd really love to pour over every page of your terrific slide deck here. Uh, there's one more major subject that I want to hit, which is, okay, I really agree with you that this day of reckoning is coming. But your conclusion in your interview with Keith McCullough was you think it's probably within the next six months. And I, I want to point out too, although our mutual friend Keith McCullough is not an oil guy, he's a very accomplished macro guy. And his reaction was to say, look, I don't even need all of this to be long oil. I think from a macro standpoint, if I look at growth and inflation trends, it's time to be long oil. So, you know, he's definitely agreeing with you there. But the one caveat I've got to throw out is, Mark, wait a minute. As much as I couldn't agree more that this day of reckoning is coming that transitions us to a new regime where the age of abundance is over and we're in the next, what from a price standpoint will feel like the peak oil regime where the price is dramatically higher. Couldn't all of that be delayed by at least a year by a recession? So I think that's a great question. And and so what, what I said uh, on the Hedgeye interview is that I think the inflection point is in the next six months. And the reason I think it's the next six months is because not only do we have demand issues right this second, but we have this little last gasp of supply coming from the conventional projects that were sanctioned in the $100 oil world, so Brazil and, Nor and Norway, which I, I mentioned. But once you get through the first half of 2020 and you're into the second half of 2020, you're going to be in a very different supply situation. And you're going to be looking forward to 2021. There's going to be no large projects coming on. So that's going to be very different. And we haven't focused on this in this conversation, although I talk about it in detail with, with Hedgeye. But I think it's very clear that there's a shale slowdown coming as well. And so I think when you get to the back half of 2020, supply fears are going to be a predominant focus for the market. Now, if we have a recession, I think what that does is it takes the oil price lower from here. It takes the stocks lower from here. What I still think the inflection point is in the first half of the year. I just think it happens from a lower level. So for me, the large factors that are going to matter if you were to time this you know, over the next six months are, firstly, do you get a trade deal? And I know that there's a, a, a sort of consensus out there among some people that think, well, you know, we're going to get this trade deal and, and perhaps it's going to be disappointing and the market's going to go straight down. But what I, what I would say is that for oil, there's really nothing more important than the trade deal from a macro perspective. And I have a, a slide in my deck where I, I look at what has happened with global trade. You'll find that on page 39 of the slide deck. What it, it points out is it points out that in 2019, we had the fourth lowest year for trade growth going back to 1980, but we had the 11th lowest year for GDP growth. So it was obviously much worse for trade, which affects oil. And so I actually think that in 2019, although we've had 
a cut to demand, I think demand has, has run even lower than what the IEA says. And, and this sort of is a more complicated discussion. It ties in with the IEA's miscellaneous to balance, which is effectively their adjustment factor. But to me, we have not seen the drainage and in inventory that you would have expected in 2019. And I think that's because demand has been even worse than what the forecasting bodies think. And so I think we've already experienced a pretty extreme recession for the oil world because trade was so bad. Now, if we don't get a trade deal, which, you know, as anyone's guess, I suppose, I think that that's going to be a, a large negative, but I would think that that would be felt immediately. And, and so I think the stocks would go lower, you know, in the immediate future. And then the, the inflection point, because an inflection point is, you know, basically when you go from the downward trend to the upward trend, I, I would still think the inflection points in the first half of the year next year, just because when you get to the second half and you look forward, the supply picture is, is so dire. Other factors on the short term that will impact this inflection point is, of course, we're having the OPEC meeting in, in a couple of days, and what they decide to do is, is going to be quite important. Another near-term impact, which I, I don't talk at all on the hedge eye conversation, is IMO 2020. I'm sure you're aware of the sulfur fuel regulations changing for ships, but that could, uh, I mean, I think that's likely to give a one-time boost to demand, but I feel like that's not really important to this conversation. It's more of a, a larger, longer-term picture. But I hear you on the recession point, and I think that that's uh, a very important thing to consider, but I still think the timing is now, it's just a question of from what level. Okay, Mark, again, I wish we had more time to really go deeper into this, but I think we're really in very strong agreement that the big picture here is what really drives price is not next Wednesday's inventory report. It's what regime we're in. We went from the peak oil regime to the age of abundance regime. We both agree that on the horizon, there is a regime change where we get to recognizing that supply really is finite and that electric vehicles are not going to to change everything. The few places where we disagree slightly are simply, I, I agree with you that uh, it should be coming really soon in the next six months. The thing is, I, for the last 10 years, I, I've been feeling like this should come in the next six months. And, and it seems to always take longer than I think. And in the meantime, I do think, especially after the election, there's a good chance that we're headed into recession. I think we've been putting off an overdue recession for too long now, mostly through machinations of central bankers. Uh, I think that is coming and it could delay things a little bit, but there's no doubt in my mind that all of this stuff comes true. And when we do get that regime change to the recognition that electric vehicles don't solve all of our problems and that oil supply really is finite, I think it does take us to a much, much higher regime of prices. What have I left out? What have I missed in terms of summarizing our arguments today? I think that was a great summary, Eric. I think we're about to transition from an age of abundance to uh, a return to scarcity. Uh, on the supply side, tight oil, I think, is about to grow a lot less quickly. And uh, the Hedge Eye interview makes that clear. I think, uh, additionally, conventional oil is about to roll over for both geologic reasons and CapEx reasons. So I think the supply side is very clearly going to be a problem. And I think the market's going to focus on that in about six months, if not sooner. And then on the demand side, you're right, we do need to be concerned about a recession. But what I would say is that the issues we have with demand right now are cyclical and not secular. That's going to get resolved. And I think uh, additionally, the market's going to come to a, a realization that EVs are not the uh, silver bullet for the oil industry. And uh, demand is actually going to be stronger than what people anticipate. I think that, just to underline this point, that the concern around global warming is going to lead directly to an oil price spike because the cut to CapEx will have a larger impact on supply than the impact for EVs are going to have on demand.
Mark, you have taken all of these views, assimilated them together into a strategy for the Ascent Oil Fund, which unfortunately for some of our listeners is structured in, in a vehicle which is only available to accredited investors. But fortunately, we have a very large accredited investor audience. Please tell our accredited audience who are interested in finding out more about what you're doing with Ascent Oil Fund, how they can contact you in order to get your pitch book and so forth. Well, you can just email me at mg at ascentoilfund.com. I'm happy to share my pitch book or have conversations with people there. And uh, you know, basically, I have a fund that is a long-only oil equity fund. And I'm confident that uh, when the thesis plays out, it will go up you know, quite a lot. I, I feel like it's a, a very good hedge to have a, a position in the fund in case this turns out because, of course, what probably leads to the recession is an oil price spike. We haven't had that yet, but uh, most uh, recessions have been driven by an oil price spike. And I think that that's coming. And uh, I think everyone needs to be uh, concerned about that. I think that's actually what's going to ultimately cause the large problem for the global economy. Well, Mark, I think you're one of very, very few people in the industry who are looking at all of the right issues. And I think you're exactly right that this regime change from an age of abundance to the next age of scarcity, it's when people figure that out and the psychology changes that the whole market is going to change and change dramatically. So I think you're on the right course, and I wish you all the best with your fund. We're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voice continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was a great interview with Mark and great to have him on the show. I really enjoyed this episode because we do end up spending a lot of time talking about things like inventories and a lot of the drivers on the short term. But it's always nice to have an episode that really focuses on that bigger picture, understanding some of the, the bigger macro drivers that will influence the oil markets in the years to come. Nonetheless, you at the start were talking about the fact that, you know, you in principle agreed with all the conclusions he's coming to, but not necessarily how this is all going to play out. So how do you differ in your views and, uh, and what's different? Well, I don't even necessarily agree on all of the conclusions. Where I agree emphatically is Mark is looking at the right issues. And the way he describes it of this paradigm shift, we, we went from the age of peak oil where everybody thought incorrectly that the world was running out of oil, which is nonsense. That's not what King Hubbard predicted. That's not what Hubbard's uh, peak is all about. Most of those people who thought the world was running out of oil never understood what peak oil was. Then you went from that to this widespread perception that peak oil had somehow been disproven, which is nonsense. Hubbard's peak is very real. Its science is solid. The misinterpretation was all the people that thought it could only mean one thing, which is oil prices had to go straight up. That's not what it meant. And what we didn't see coming was the mountain of junk bond liquidity and easy money that was thrown at the shale patch, which enabled this shale revolution which delayed the predictions of the peak oil theorists by more than a decade. The thing is, that day of reconciliation is still coming. We're going to get to this, this market perception change where we go from the age of abundance to the next age of scarcity. The thing is, this is mostly about human perception. The science has been clear all along, and we went from everybody misinterpreting the science in one direction, thinking we were running out of oil, which was always silly. Then we had them thinking that th there would just be an unlimited abundance of too much oil, and there's supposedly going to be peak demand in the next few years, and we won't need oil anymore. That's utter nonsense. We're going to get to 
a paradigm shift where we realize that oil is finite, that the shale revolution is behind us, and the next revolution would have to be an Arctic, super deep water, super expensive extraction plan that we don't have the equipment for, and it's going to result in much, much higher oil prices. The place where I disagree with Mark is the way he put it is he said, you know, there's got to be an inflection point at some point where there's kind of a flip in sentiment. I agree with that. He thinks it has to be in the next six months. Uh, I've been convinced that it had to be in the next six months for the last 10 years, and, and I've been early so far. So I guess I've gotten to the point where I realize that these things take longer to play out than uh, the smartest guys in the room usually think they ought to. And I definitely agree in principle with all of the concepts that Mark's describing, except for when he says it has to happen in the next six months. And I think that the combination of recession risk, but also just the fact that you could see the U.S. shale patch continue to overproduce for a while longer, depending on what happens with OPEC and Saudi Arabia and whether or not they're really going to do uh, an international IPO or not. Uh, there's a lot of possibility. I think it's entirely within the realm of possibility that we could see a washout to where you get crude oil prices where WTI goes back down to $30 or lower, maybe a double bottom repeating that $27 low from the beginning of 2016 before that phase transition occurs. Now, that's an extreme case. I'm not saying that's likely. It's not a prediction. I think it's more likely that Mark is right and it's uphill from here. But I don't see it as nearly as clear cut as he does that, you know, the inflection point is just around the corner. I think it's coming, and I'm not sure when it's coming. Uh, I do think the macro drivers, as he discussed with Keith, are there. We're seeing a trend toward increasing inflation. I think Keith McCullough made a very important point in that hedge eye interview. He said, look, Mark, this is all really fascinating, you know, oil guy stuff. I don't even need this for me to be long oil. I just look at growth and inflation trends, and I want to be long oil. So at least right now, from a macro standpoint, lots of good reasons to be long oil. Does that mean that the inflection point to a sentiment regime shift from the age of abundance to a new age of scarcity has to happen within six months? I'm not convinced of that at all. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But in any event, Patrick, I want to get to your chart book because I know people are excited about that. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. It says postgame chart book. S&P 500 and the gamma flip, the famous Charlie McElligot gamma flip. Let's go ahead and dive in. Patrick, you've got on page two here a chart of the S&P 500, including that big drop that we saw in the last few days. Give us the update here. What is this? Is it a consolidation? What, what's, what's happening? Right. So on page two, what we're looking at is just a chart of the S&P 500. And I'm asking a simple question. Obviously, when you, whenever you have a, a market drop like we just saw on Monday going into Tuesday morning, it is classified to one degree or another as some form of a market turn. Now, the question is, is that I like to always kind of basket them into one of three scenarios. Is it a market consolidation, which is just something the market always does, pauses from its prior rise? and then consolidates and then begins the next leg higher. Number two is that it could actually be a little bit of a deeper market correction. And or number three is that this turns into a much bigger market crash. Now, I personally don't sign a very high probability to the market crash scenario, but it's an interesting question to ask as to what analog fits this and what would it look like or how would it emerge in the coming weeks if it was developing into one versus the other. And so, so on page three, what I did was I just overlaid back in March, we had two very short market consolidations before the market and each scenario paused and re-resumed its prior rise. And I thought they were a really interesting overlay to give everyone an idea that like you were sharing at the uh, during the market wrap at the beginning of the show, that if this was just a bunch of noise and the market is just pausing, then what you can observe is the last two times that the market did this, it drops that 50 to 100 S&P points. It lasts no more than a week, you know, sometimes two, three, four, five days. 
and then the market just breaks higher and then re-resumes the bull trend that has been in place. And so arguably, if this analog was what is emergent here, then we should probably by early next week have re-resumed the trend higher if this analog was uh, was the one that was playing out. So now when we were talking about uh, getting to this Charlie McElligot gamma flip, one of the things that could contribute to this not being a consolidation, but a much deeper market correction would be the flip in that. And we'll get to the gamma in a moment, but I wanted to just overlay the analogs of what the last three market corrections of this year look like and what it would be if we saw something like that develop here in going into the Christmas season. And what t- has been typical this year of a market correction is that the market will drop in the 150 to 300 S&P point range. And those corrections tend to last anywhere as little as two weeks to as long as four weeks plus. And sometimes market corrections even can be multi-month, but uh, at least this year they haven't been. And so what you can observe here is, is that if in fact this turns into a market correction rather than just a consolidation, then we're only at the beginning of it. And it could easily last not only deep into December, but it could take much of the month of December to play out if this was what we end up seeing. And now could see the S&P 500 drop below 3,000 on a temporary basis. But a correction is just, again, a correction that will ultimately lead to a short-term bottom, a buy on dip opportunity, and subsequently a turn. Now, moving on to page five, Patrick, I want to emphasize that rumors on the Internet that you and Charlie McGilligan uh, have a live event where you're going to be performing the gamma flip on trampolines has <laughs> largely been exaggerated. That's not actually in the plans. So what is this? Uh, you know, I, it's funny. I, I, I think about gamma and theta and all of these option Greeks. I think there's three kinds of investors, Patrick. There's retail investors who, when you start talking about gamma and theta and all these Greeks, they, their eyes glaze over and they say, okay, it's all Greek to me. Then you've got professional investors. They can't afford to look stupid. So they, just like the retail investors, have no clue what is being discussed, but they confidently nod and say, oh, yes, the gamma flip. <laughs> <laughs> even though they have no clue what they're talking about either. And then there's a small handful of you guys who actually trade options for a living who know what Charlie McElligot is talking about when he says there's going to be this gamma flip that could have an effect on the market. What is this that we're talking about? It's real easy to look up gamma on Wikipedia and you find out it's a second derivative and it's a rate of change in delta. What the hell does that mean and how do you relate it to the real world? Right. You, you nailed it. Gamma is just the uh, second derivative of the delta, and it's talking about the rate of change of the delta. And now I want to go deeper into this to kind of explain it even further. But essentially, gamma is what an options buyer really is buying, because what it means is that as you are more and more right, the more that the underlying option behaves like the stock or the security, and the more you're wrong, the rate of loss is decreasing. So you're, that's the option and the, the almost the asymmetry that comes with the use of options. So on page six, what I have is just a chart showing the slope of the delta on a call option. And what I'm observing here is a stock price is advancing along and going from, let's say, $10 to $11. And the delta is changing from a 50 cent delta to like a 65 cent delta. That is changing at the rate of gamma. So why does this matter? Well, it's really, it's on page seven that it's what makes it relevant when someone like Charlie McElligot talks about it, which is, is the characteristic that the shorter the duration of the option the more influence gamma has on the option. And so what you have is is the gamma sensitivity increases. So when a dealer, a market maker, a dealer has all of these options on their book, they're delta hedging their portfolio risk. And while they may be delta hedged, every day it becomes closer to the expiration of, a, let's say, like a golf ball in the garden hose moment of expiration on a big exposure they have. They have increasing gamma risks as it's, every day we're getting closer and closer to the expiration. And what that really is in simplicity saying is that a dealer can become offside on their book 
much quicker with a much smaller move in the market as their gamma risks increase. And so that means that as we approach expirations, the sensitivity of these dealers increases. And so this is where I want to get in on page eight to that chart that Charlie McElligot often shares with our listeners when, when he comes onto the show. And he, he shows that chart of, of the S&P and SPY combined gamma as per 1% versus spot. And it shows this one moment in the market where is, there's this gamma flip, where, where you go from being long, uh, dealers go from being long gamma to being short gamma. And, and I wanted to just kind of explain to our listeners what that means. A lot of people, when they think of dealers, they assume dealers are always short options and the retail investor or institution is long the calls or long the puts. But that actually doesn't tend to be the case. Now, I always say tend to because we dealer exposures are always dynamically changing. But if I was to most broadly paint what a position dealers often find themselves in is, is that the popularity of covered call writing or selling premium overlay on your um, existing stock positions is an incredibly popular strategy. And so often what happens is dealers end up being net buyers of call options. And so what happens is that they end up selling a series of institutions and retail investors are selling those calls and they end up putting it on their books long. At the same time, often in in the form of a caller, and or just people buying insurance, dealers are often the sellers of puts and subsequently retails and uh, and institutional people find themselves often long put options to hedge tail risk or insurance. And this relationship actually often can be seen by the skew in the, the volatility skew in, in the option, which is there's a tendency for call options to be priced at very low volatilities. At the same time, put options have that fat left tail, which is the implied volatilities go higher and higher on out-of-the-money puts, making them more expensive. And that's because of the way often dealers end up being stuck with their books on there. And so what Charlie is trying to show with the gamma flip is essentially – Assuming that a dealer is always striving to be delta neutral on their book of options and exposures, if they tend to be long a a large number of call options, as a market is rising, they are long gamma and therefore they're actually getting more long the market. And if their goal is to stay delta neutral, then they actually sell futures such as S&P futures, to actually bring their net exposures back down toward to zero. So in fact, as a market is rallying, dealers are selling futures. This actually contributes to suppressing volatility. And this is why we tend to see into market rallies, even volatility compress, ranges get tight. And even as we get into options expiration, I think it also contributes to the fact that sometimes the market will actually get pinned into an expiration. But what ends up happening, the gamma flip point, which in, at this moment Charlie is saying is around the 3,070 level on the S&P, is where the put options start having a much larger influence. And therefore, because the dealers are short these puts, they actually are offside and they need to actually therefore short more S&P futures to go back to neutral. And so while they were suppressing volatility on the way up, they're actually contributing to volatility on the way down because they're shorting into weakness. And so recognizing the gamma flip is sort of trying to identify when volatility is at risk of becoming bigger in the market. Let me see, Patrick, if I can translate that to English for the benefit (laughs) of some of our audience. There's these guys called options market makers who play a very big role in the market because what they're doing is they don't like to take risk and speculate on the stock market. They try to always have positioning where they're net neutral so that the options that they have sold to people and the positions that they own in futures all balance out to where they don't have any market risk and they're just making this nice premium that they get due to the the mathematics of how they've structured the options that they've sold. As they're doing that, they're constantly buying and selling futures in the market and that moves the market which affects everybody else. Most of the time, 
That's a negative feedback loop, meaning that as things start to get crazy, it forces those option market makers to make moves which help to make the world less crazy. It dampens volatility. It reduces the craziness of the market. Until you cross a certain level, which is what Charlie's calling the gamma flip level. And that triggers a different set of mathematics. Now, at that point, the option market makers, they haven't changed their strategy. They're still not speculating. They're not taking any speculative position in the market. But the necessary buying and selling that they have to do in order to keep their own book risk neutral so that they don't get screwed if the market goes against them that buying and selling that they do suddenly is exacerbating market volatility instead of dampening it. So all of a sudden, when you get to a certain mathematically predictable level in the market, it causes the very people that were serving as a damper to help calm volatility, they now basically lose their cool and start doing something that causes the market to get more volatile. This is going to be a Big disappointment to most of our listeners who were really looking forward to seeing you and Charlie perform the Gamma Flip, which they assumed <laughs> was a trampoline act. Now, you do have an event coming up. Tell us about that, and will you be performing the trampoline version of the Gamma Flip? <laughs> no, I won't be. Well, before, we, uh, before I talk about the event, I wanted to just add one last thing. It's interesting that the S&P 500 low that came in on Tuesday was pretty much a re very close to the a gamma flip level of 3,070. And so what will be interesting is, is that so long as the market stays above this level, then the dealers are not contributing to volatility. And this whole thing could just end up being a small market pause and the market could resume higher. But if for whatever reason, even if it's a Trump tweet, whatever happens, if we see that uh, coming into the end of this week or into next week, the sell-off actually starts breaking down to a fresh new low, lower than what we had earlier this week. Now uh, we have a scenario that could contribute to the volatility, and that's where that analog of a bigger, deeper market correction, where the dealers could actually be contributing to that manifesting itself. And so that's, that's going to be really interesting to see what develops there. With that said, uh, like you were saying, I'm going to be uh, doing a complimentary boot camp for all my members and free trialers on December 13th. And anyone who has access to a, our complimentary free trial and or is a member will be able to watch it. We're doing a session on how to find asymmetry in your favorite commodity stocks using options the right way. And one of the parts of that is the idea of buying this gamma. So and during that boot camp, I'm going to be talking about it, but we're going to put a we're going to try to explain it without a trampoline. What I can't let go of the trampoline. What if what if we, we talked to CNBC and we got somebody like Jim Cramer dressed up in a clown suit and when the S and P crosses that critical level that Nomura has calculated, you you just immediately cue Kramer in his clown suit doing some kind of flip on the trampoline. <laughs> now I guess he doesn't need the clown suit. Oh, great idea. You can, uh, you can uh, write into CNBC and propose it if you wanted to. <laughs> okay. Well, Kramer doesn't need the clown suit, though. He's got the clown thing going on without it. All right. So when is the event and how do people sign up for those who are willing to tolerate the lack of a trampoline in your version of the Gamma Flip? They just have to go to bigpicturetrading.com and uh, register for the free trial. And anybody, even if you've had a free trial in the past, you can still access a new free trial and join us for the boot camp so that anyone who wants to can do so. Well, it's hard to turn that one down. Today's episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Top Traders Unplugged. Be sure to check out my full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson, published on September 7th, 2019. The link is in your Research Roundup email. Now, if you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you haven't registered yet for your free account at macrovoices.com. Won't cost you a penny. We won't spam you or try to sell you anything. We'll just send you all of the best links that we could find to free market research, plus the links to download chart books for our own programming. That's called the Research Roundup, and you get it every single week free of charge from Macro Voices. Just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com, click on the red button that says looking for the downloads in order to get information on how to register. Patrick, tell them what they're missing in this week's Research Roundup. 
So you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to the slide deck for Mark Gordon's presentation and as well as the charts we discussed in the post game. There's also an interesting link to a video of a panel conversation between Ray Dalio and Paul Tudor Jones as well as a link to Convexity Maven Harley Bassman's 2020 model portfolio. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and we're always looking looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.